Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. We're joined this week by some folks behind the Earthbound Farmer's Almanac, a self-published annual collection of art, comics, facts, articles, and incitements to challenge us to thicken our relationship to the land and grow autonomy against state, colonialism, and capitalism. You can order copies of the book from EmergentGoods.com or read it in portions on their social media for free. We also talk about spreading food forests and building neighborly food resilience with Lobelia Commons in so-called New Orleans. You can find links in our show notes. A few acronyms come up in this chat, and here's a quick breakdown. MADR is Mutual Aid Disaster Relief Network. Zeta, Zeta and Ida were hurricanes that damaged the southeast of Turtle Island, landfalling near so-called New Orleans. And NOMAG is the New Orleans Mutual Aid Group. So could you all please introduce yourselves with any relevant information that you'd like to share, who you are or where you are, uh, preferred pronouns, ETC? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm M. I use he, him, uh, and... I am in southwestern Mississippi at the moment, uh, but I bounce between southwest Mississippi and uh, New Orleans, a.k.a. Bulbacha. And B, they, them are my pronouns, and I'm bouncing also back and forth between Mississippi and New Orleans, Bulbacha. And I'm Hadley, and I use they, them pronouns, um, and I'm also kind of bouncing in and out of New Orleans, but I'm located west of New Orleans. Uh, I live at a project called the Indian Bayou Food Forest that is like a propagation and free plant nursery, basically. Cool. Do you all mind if I ask a couple of clarifying questions? Okay. Sure. Um, Yeah. Can you talk about that food propagation uh, project a little bit, Hadley, like um, anything that you'd, you'd want to share in like any way that people can learn more about that? Sounds pretty cool. Uh, yeah, totally. So it actually grew out of the campaign against the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, and folks may be familiar with its earlier incarnation as the Loe La Vie camp, and that same location basically after the pipeline was finished, which was kind of rerouted around the camp to avoid the conflict, uh, but currently runs next door to the food forest. This is the fourth year of it as a farm project, basically, and kind of the goal was to, like, take this land that had started as a point of conflict uh, against, like, petrochemical infrastructure in the Gulf South and then sort of pivot from that point to, like, looking towards some kind of regenerative future. And so we found that, like, the strategy that we could do with this place was to just, like, use it as a little base to propagate as many fruit trees to give away as possible. So a lot of the trees that uh, Lobelia commons, which we'll also be talking about plants in New Orleans are propagated here or at, you know, another rural space that we'll probably talk about also. Cool. There's obviously like, depending on how close you are, like blowouts from pipelines is, is a danger that has like that that's one of the things that has brought people into the streets or into the swamps in this case to block the construction of these sort of large pipelines and also they tend to leak is there any fears of that or have you been trying to work around that in terms of like propagating food plants in that area oh yeah i mean it's definitely a concern thankfully we aren't particularly near to a valve station uh, or a pump station which is where the majority of like smaller pipeline leaks happen. And then, yeah, like if there were to be like a, a major blowout or something, like all we can do is hope that it's not in the little section of the 165 mile pipeline that we're at. But we, we do kind of also understand that we're surrounded by these other pipeline, a lot of other pipelines too, that like probably are a lot older or definitely are a lot older and probably are leaking a little bit in different places and and whatnot but that's the nice thing about having a propagation nursery too is like we're sending out trees and then you know hopefully we we, i think we do have good soil but like you know even if we send out a tree that had grown up with a little bit of oil in its soil uh it's going to get hopefully put into a healthier habitat later and, and whatnot 
cool. And for listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the geography of Gulf Southeast, can you all who are traveling back and forth between Mississippi and New Orleans say a little bit about like, is is there much distance between those two places? Are they like pretty similar um, biomes? Uh, yeah, so that's part of the reason why we're here is like the geographic proximity, but difference in terms of like drainage and elevation and especially just generally in the Gulf South, like any amount of elevation really matters in terms of like the type of storms that you experience, um, what flooding looks like, um, just the general like potential inclement scenarios you could find yourself in. And so where we are is about an hour and a half north of, of New Orleans. And New Orleans is like between like 10 feet above sea level and like 10 feet below sea level. And where we are is around like 300 to 400, depending on where you are. So it's like a pretty, pretty dramatic shift, even though like 300 feet above sea level is like not really obviously that much, but ecologically it's quite different. And that's largely because of that elevation. So the like forest types like a pine oak hickory slash like kind of piney woods area. We're in the very southern end of the what's called the pine belt. Historically was like longleaf pine forests, pitch pine. So harvesting turpentine and growing pine for for timber, for, for lumber. And that still continues on today. So historically quite poor soil is very acidic. And yeah, so as opposed to New Orleans being a lot more flat, not being, not having a ton of agricultural space or in, in the area immediately surrounding it, and largely because of the logistics that go into literally just reclaiming that space for development. Yeah, so we're we're here among other things to talk about the Earthbound Farmers Almanac. Can you talk a bit about the project, how it got started, and and what people can find in it? Uh, yeah, so the Farmers Almanac started a little over two years ago, I think. This is our second printing and we kind of like started as like a little bit of like, like a ha ha joke kind of like wouldn't it be funny if type thing but then we kind of like the idea and a lot of the projects that we've come up with in Lobelia Commons has been of uh, experimental what if ideas that then we took seriously and saw what what we could do with it and and I think that that's kind of in the story of the almanac for at least for me, what I've been inspired by is just like how it's grown and other people have taken to it. And it's kind of like an open-ended thing that people can like obviously submit to, but also has been a way of meeting people through, you know, we put out on social media that if people want to distribute it, they, they can and just like basically pay at cost. If that sometimes we just give them away and they pay shipping and then they can use it as like a fundraiser for if they have like some kind of food sovereignty project or local neighborhood initiative or something like that. Or sometimes there's a rural garden center, you know, book club kind of thing, or like um, just given out to a bunch of rural friends or, or, or what have you. So we've made a lot of connections and I think other people have made connections through distributing it, which is definitely something. I mean, I think that we thought there was potential for that, but I don't think that we expected to have the kind of impact that it has. How has it grown from issue to issue? I mean, you can only see that scale, I guess, because you said it's a second printing or a second issue. How has it changed? And, and can you talk a bit about like the content of it? Yeah, so it definitely, I would like say it's more robust this this time around. I think there's so many things that you can put into an almanac. Like if you look at the, you know, the ones you would find at like the grocery store or whatever, like there's everything from like horoscope to like recipes to moon calendar, maybe growing tips and some, you know, weird Christian stuff and some weird, funny stuff. It's kind of all over the board. So it, as a project, the possibilities sometimes can be very overwhelming. I think the first issue, we did a good job of trying a bunch of stuff and like trying to be like, Oh, we should do this. We should do this. We should do this. But we're all doing this as volunteers and definitely not making any money off this. So uh, we were stretched pretty thin. But what's what's nice about this most recent issue, the second issue, is that 
uh, I think other people took to that and started submitting things that are kind of like elaborating on that idea of what kind of reference material can you include? What's like a comic that could be done for it? Different ways of writing for it. And so I think it's more like filled out. I think it's maybe even a little bit longer, maybe like maybe like 15, 20 pages longer than the last one, but less in terms of that. It feels like uh, denser or richer or something. And we also printed a lot more of them and are hoping to distribute them more widely, both regionally. Regionally, we distribute in garden centers and um, some friendly nurseries, various local businesses throughout like the Gulf South. And then, like I was saying previously, like to friends around the country and, and actually even out, outside of the country. Yeah. And just to add on to that a little bit, I, I think one of the things that's like really clearly kind of grown into the second issue, and I'm excited to see how like it develops into later issues is the reference section is is just kind of getting more and more filled out and we're reprinting things from the previous year like there was a really nice comic strip from last year that like explains fruit tree propagation with nice little diagrams of like how to cut the branches and everything like that and we reprinted that and reprinted a comic on banana propagation and like also have a lot of just new resources like maps that show some of the shifting hardiness zones or growing zones throughout the U.S. of where the coldest minimum temperature is and how climate change has changed that and things like that. And it's actually like for me, just like doing stuff around the garden, I'm actually starting to like have the almanac around to reach for because it's like, oh, the seed germination temperature chart is going to be really useful for this. The the soil chart is going to be really useful for that. And I think another thing that we like that we filled out a lot more this year was historic dates and things like that in the calendar section to add more reference points of a global radical history of struggle around food and land and stuff, which is like obviously an incredibly huge topic uh, that covers struggles like literally all over the world. But uh, we tried to at least have like more sort of little entry points or, you know, just citations of, of things for people to get excited about and then do more research. So it says in the editorial statement that not all the contributors and editors are a part of Lobelia Commons, but for those who are involved with that project, can you tell us a bit about that collective and about its relationship to um, so-called New Orleans? Uh, and I could you repeat the the indigenous name for the territory that somebody referenced? I think it was M. Bulbancha. I can take that. Lobelia started pretty much right when the pandemic hit. Um, so it kind of came out of the swelling of interest and in mutual aid. And so a number of us had started a New Orleans mutual aid group. And that kind of grew out of this pre-existing food share. And basically there wasn't food coming in from the port that was basically providing the, the excess with which that food share existed. And so then the project basically was like buying bulk from Costco as many each other projects around the country were doing. And so Nomag, as it became known, uh, really just got a ton of volunteers. So many people um, lined up for that. And a number of us who were, were involved in starting it also were like gardening and like doing like weird stuff with mushrooms and whatever, just got kind of nerding out about plants and like the logistics of what allows New Orleans to exist in its like contemporary state. So we just started, we we're like, oh, let's just do our, our kind of our own thing about like focusing on food autonomy because this is, you know, we're clearly missing something. Like if, if a pandemic hits or if some kind of severe crisis hits, the experience of New Orleans tells us a lot about like FEMA and, and that the state is really not coming. And if the state does come, it looks like huge lines at like a food bank or something like that or or, you know, um, just like these kind of paltry things. So like, how, how can we start to like chip away? What, what does like experimentation look like in terms of like really fundamentally relating to, to food and place differently, um, than, than we are raised to basically taught, basically taught to. So the, you know, it's like, we've done a number of projects and a lot of things have, you know, just like not stayed the test of time or, you know, some things have have failed or whatever, but we started with like a plant delivery service, basically. So when people were like delivering groceries, we were delivering plant starts. 
then when it no longer felt as necessary to do like this delivery thing, also that was like a ton of labor for no real reason. We basically just started promoting like a, what we call the decentralized nursery, which is just like a newfangled name for something that people already do throughout the world. Basically, if you're starting some plants for your garden, just start a few extra and put them out in front of your house and give them out for free to your neighbors or whatever. So we tried to like encourage people to do that a lot. And, and it's, you know, a lot of people started meeting their neighbors and, you know, maybe like, you know, a punk house who is living in a black neighborhood, you know, some white punks who had never had good relationships with their neighbors for a number of reasons, you know, suddenly are talking to their neighbors and there's starting to be this breaking down of like a, a colonial line over this like meeting point of, of plants. And uh, we w went on to start an, a number of other projects, maybe one of which that's still going on is uh, this mycology club, which started at, we call it like the Mushroom Collaborative. But now we're basically, I think actually the upcoming this week, we're doing an inoculation, but the idea is basically just to like learn with each other about how to produce mushrooms, learn how to identify mushrooms, just, you know, do foraging walks. And we meet every now and then and, we're open to like people joining and we, it's a very caring space. Like people bring coffee and donuts and usually someone brings some kind of like critical reading about uh, mushrooms or fungi generally. And it's been, it's been a great space. And our, the project I'm most excited about within that group is to, um, to form like what we're calling like a mushroom commons and to basically inoculate logs with say shiitake or lion's mane or, or reishi and basically hide them around the, some of the parks in the city uh, that people could then start to forage in the in the urban setting but yeah i don't know hadley maybe you want to take one yeah yeah there's definitely a bunch of uh, other little projects or initiatives that i could speak to you that are that are more the things i've been involved in because one of the things that is like really nice about lobelia is is kind of like we always sort of intended it to be a very decentralized thing that doesn't feel tied to one particular space within the city. It's not tied to one particular, you know, activity or like, you know, even like gardening specifically. We want to imagine it being like a much larger range of like whatever people are excited about doing. So like one, for example, that I, I haven't participated in as much as I'd like because I'm, I'm out of the city and so I, I miss their public days sometimes. The Herb Commons group has been really cool where it's like a bunch of people with a lot of skills around herbalism who gather different things or, you know, they'll, they'll put the, the call to the larger group and like those of us who are growing herbs can contribute some of what we have or some of what we're, you know, harvesting wild or something and send it to the, the folks working on the herb common stuff. And then they go and do a pop-up tent in a public park or along a walking path or something and have informational materials and just like lots of different herbs for people to try and take home and learn about you know, including like fun activities. I went one day and they were teaching people how to dye clothes with uh, mulberry dye and also just giving away all these herbs and everything. Uh, and that one's really cool because it's also a nice way. If people don't want to go do the public herb commons thing, they can engage with it more on the level of just like being a gardener who grows a bunch of herbs and like sends it to the herb commons, you know, or they can have that kind of more like active communal interaction with it. The, the one that I, I sort of, put a lot of my time into maybe as I already mentioned is uh, what we call the front yard orchard initiative just front yard orchards and that is basically just the goal to propagate and if we can fundraise to buy cheaply as many fruit trees as possible and give them away to people and help people plant them if, the, if they want that help ideally in the front yard, but we, we aren't actually strict about that. Like if people have a, a better spot for the tree in their backyard and, you know, we know that they're going to share it with their family and their neighbors and whatnot. Like it's like still thought of as this like contribution to the overall food commons that we're trying to create. And so, yeah, through that, we've been propagating and, and giving away and planting well over a hundred fig and mulberry trees and then lots and lots of other trees that are a little easier to come by or easier to 
banana, moringa, things like that. And also like trees that we have to uh, fundraise and buy. We've also been giving away a bunch of citrus and pecans and, and things like that. And what's been also really nice about that has been like just getting connected with other young farmers in the city who are like excited to also just like help give stuff away. Cause it's like, it's one thing to grow like 200 trees, but then trying to go out and find spots for them all. Like we've just been handing them off to people and they've planted like well over 50 in neutral grounds, which for, for folks who aren't familiar with new Orleans, like the, the neutral ground is what you refer to the, the kind of green grassy strip between two one-way streets which are really common so there's they're just like all over the city and it's like people are walking along them and a lot of time it's where you park your car if the water is going to be high or something but yeah we've just been planting a lot of fruit trees through that project and then the last one i'll mention right now is just kind of a little informal like harvest crew or a harvest group where we just kind of let each other know and keep track of like different things that are just already growing in the city that don't get utilized there's just so many fruit trees that are sometimes in kind of wild and camp spaces or sometimes they're in front of businesses and they didn't, don't get utilized or whatever. So we just go out and pick a lot of like figs and loquats and mulberries and, and try to have some sort of collective processing of those things to save them or, or give them away in some way. And that one has also just been really great to get people noticing the place that they're living a little bit more and developing a relationship with the place. There's this one particular park near the place I stay at in New Orleans that they just recently clear cut all these beautiful elderberries and mulberries that we used to go harvest from. And so, you know, now we're sort of starting to think like whether or not we need to start paying a little bit more attention to like the local neighborhood association politics or whatever other terrible stuff is happening in that realm. But anyways. Yeah, I just I wanted to bring up a project that we've been involved in, which is um, working with our friend who is a neighbor and a black elder and community member. She's a black mama. Her name's Miss Althea and her roof and her house got very damaged in Zeta and then continued to get pretty severely damaged during Ida. And so we've just been working with her and Matter and Nomag to get a roof on her house and to try to like eventually get solar panels and just kind of see how far we can go with getting her set up so that she continues to be able to support her community in the ways that she has been for many, many years. And um, we've just been talking about the cyclical nature of disaster relief and how like short term it can be and like spring up immediately after disaster but the longevity of that is just pretty short-lived and so trying to like sustain that because like we're just we're living in the disaster and we're going to be constantly coming up against these things and so just creating situations and supporting people who are already doing the thing um to be able to like, continue that um so that yeah we're just we're not constantly one foot in one foot out we're like firmly facing each thing as it comes along and we're prepared for it so like in relation to that work that you're mentioning and also the example earlier that was given of the white punk house um that started relating better to like black neighbors um, by sharing plants and having a thing in common and, and you know, literally sharing uh, the means of survival in a lot of ways. New Orleans, like a lot of other places around the country that particularly have like large populations of color, have a lot of history of gentrification. And I've heard lots of stories of like white punks, for instance, moving into like I, I grew up in the outer Bay Area. Uh, a lot of my friends decided to move to Oakland because housing costs were inexpensive. And that while they were not personally responsible, they definitely contributed to the um, displacement of, of black and brown populations that have been living there generationally. And so building those sort of connections sounds really important. And it's awesome that y'all are working with that elder. And I guess another part of that too, and these are kind of thoughts that'll lead into a question that I've seen and also talked to people who have done mutual aid projects. And I don't know the makeup of y'all, like the 
ethnic and racial makeup of y'all's group. But in a lot of instances, it's a lot of like white folks who have uh, some extra time and maybe a little bit of resources and are able to do mutual aid, often distributing stuff into black and brown communities and, and poor communities. And while it's like a cool project that sustains people and takes off some of the pressure of capitalism from folks and racialized capitalism, it doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily able to bridge the gap between charity and mutual aid. It doesn't bring folks in and also allow itself to be shaped by the people who these folks are living beside and who are like taking advantage of the project. So, you know, you already given one a good example right now with your neighbor who you're helping with her roof, which is great. But I wonder like, how does, how does Lobelia like deal with, for instance, like, is it mostly white people that are coming in, picking up the plants, you know, are they putting them in their yards and increasing the property value of their neighborhood? And have you had any sort of insights or experience of making that branch between like, and I don't know, again, if y'all are from New Orleans either, but sort of that branch between moving from charity into like a mutual aid project that can not only help sustain people, but also contribute to like an oppositional force, like strengthening the communities against capitalism and gentrification. Yeah. So um, I think there's a lot of obviously really good stuff there. Um, I think Lobelia itself was definitely started by people who fit that description largely white, you know, younger, uh, mostly transplant and, you know, have a little bit of extra time. It was almost all the projects were funded basically with like unemployment and stuff. So that definitely um, fits that bill. And I, I think that where we've put our focus is moving away from that charity thing. And I think a lot of people say this and don't actually mean it. I, I think probably everyone who's being in Lobelia, quote unquote, is like kind of a funny thing because people come and go all the time. So it's not really like like a, a membership per se, but the people who like do stuff that gets called Lobelia or whatever, I think have all probably done mutual aid that is effectively charity. And we all know that that feels terrible. It, it's super draining. And I think honestly, most people that are involved with doing Lobelia activities are pretty generally over activism or at least critical of activism in some kind of way. So most of our energy is, is like localized. It's like where we are pretty much. So like the decentralized nursery as an example is like, well, that's something that just relates to like your neighbors. We're not like meeting up and being like, okay, where's the most marginalized group that we can go support? If there's like, you know, a group that reaches out to us that's maybe doing that work and wants a bunch of plants for whatever reason or what, you know, wants a garden or something it, that has happened in the past. And like the Louisiana Seafood Worker Alliance, like I think the past two years, we've given them between like 50 and 200 Roselle hibiscus plants. But we're not like organizing in that kind of way. It's really like we need to eat and our neighbors need to eat and we want to talk to our neighbors and like have strong connections with our neighbors. And that, that, that comes from not this like idealistic or selfless kind of thing. I mean, in, in some ways it's like, well, no, I, I want to have fun when I'm doing this. And oftentimes it's very joyless to just seek out how we can do the most good or whatever. And so that's, I think that's largely why we've been rooted in like specifically where we are. And I think the relationship with Althea is probably the greatest articulation. I mean, that's some of us have known Althea for like seven or eight years. And some of us were like eventually pushed out of that neighborhood, but keep, still keep up very strong relationships um, with a lot of people that continue to live there or were forced out uh, of that neighborhood as well. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. You will never, ever surrender or compromise! We occupied government buildings, we blockaded highways, and we talked about not just marching, but direct action to shut this shit down! Here we go! 
Yate, we invite you to join us for Indigenous Action, a podcast where we dig deep into critical issues impacting our communities in the occupied lands known as the so-called United States or what many people recognize as Turtle Island. This is an autonomous, anti-colonial broadcast with unapologetic and claws-out analysis towards total liberation. So take your seat by this fire and may the bridges we burn together light our way. Find us at indigenousaction.org and with the Channel Zero Network. So this isn't so much meaning to be directed at you all individually. I'm just kind of hoping that, because I know the like, there's a decolonial lens that shows up frequently in the book. And I think that it's important to like to talk about that and to sort of like talk about the difficulty of navigating being a part of a settler colonial society and that we're like settler colonism is an ongoing project and not one that's like past, which is a thing that the book points to. So I'm kind of like wondering like when people talk about infrastructure projects, if you, if you have thoughts about how that relates to uh, again, settler colonial society. Uh, yeah. I mean, I might have kind of a rambly answer to it. Um, It'll match my rambly questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of different, a, a lot of different aspects to, to how to approach it. Like, I mean, I, I think a, a big part of it just has to do with, with history and getting acquainted with the history of the places that we're in and like making sure we keep those things present in 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 a way like i don't know i guess like here here at indian bayou we we grow some sugarcane and i feel like we there's no way to grow sugarcane and and have people here and give them the tour here and and talk them talk to them about the sugarcane that we grow which is really just it's a tiny little bit i kind of we just kind of have it as a as a little bit of a visual barrier honestly for the most part but like you can't grow sugarcane without talking about the history of slavery and the way that plant was like so integral to the whole colonial project in so many ways in this region and you know sometimes people talk about new orleans as like the northernmost caribbean city or whatever it's like definitely like like we're very close to like all of that history. So like when I talk about sugarcane, I talk about growing sugarcane. Like I like to try to teach people if they don't know about it already, people who are visiting the farm or something like talk about the, the Haitian revolution and talk about CLR James, the, the black Jacobins, which I like try to recommend to people or, you know, we have it in the library here and I try to get people to read from it or, you know, talk about the history of the way James describes the enslaved people in the the Northern Plains of Haiti at that time, who like were in some sense, one of the earliest like industrial proletariats in the world. Cause they lived in these huge camps with hundreds of people working these huge body destroying mills and stuff. And just like, as soon as they had the opportunity, they, you know, chased all the slave owners into the cane fields and lit the cane fields alight and, burn them alive there. And so I I think we need to come at it from a sense of we are coming from a settler colonial society, some of us, but we just need to be clear about which side we're on to some extent. And in this space in particular, because of our having been rooted in this struggle against this pipeline, you know, that was led by indigenous people, we, we have a bunch of very direct relationships. So we can actually, you know, very easily like, be sending stuff here to our, to our friends on the res in the Southwest, you know, somewhere, you know, not to be specific or anything, but yeah, there's like, you know, various forms of support that we can give having this place and just as a refuge for people to come through and lots of different things like that. And, and it's definitely not that easy for people who are just trying to have a relationship to land and a land project or inside a city or something like that. And, they don't already have those connections. And yeah, it can feel weird to be like, okay, well, I don't want to be a settler 
here doing my garden project. So I need to go out and like find the most public facing indigenous organization or something to go meet those people or something like, like it just has sort of a kind of top down looking at the world, like a map sort of colonial viewpoint, almost even to just approaching things from that way sometimes. So I don't have clear answers for, for people in other contexts, but yeah. Yeah. I think that's why our focus on the connection between these rural farms and the city is so important because aside from obviously just like doing an isolated thing, having that connection is what literally makes, say, a farm in the rural South or anywhere for that matter. That's what makes it, having that connection is what makes it actually become counter infrastructure or something that can be used more, more widely and for partisan ends. So having those places and the connections and having it be social is what allows for like establishing these kind of flows. And I think it's important to kind of like encourage a, like a familiarity with the place um, as people come and visit to these various farm or rural spaces from the city and vice versa to encourage a kind of familiarity while like maintaining a kind of openness to maybe potential discomfort that could come therein. Um, there's actually a piece in the almanac called Beyond the Levee. And it talks a lot about like this historical counter infrastructure or maybe like infrastructure against the state and the colony. And that obviously took place in the form of Maroons in most famously, but also in other forms of desertion and fugitivity and at times insurrection and it, at the, the piece ends with this kind of imagining of a not so distant future where um, state infrastructure has collapsed to uh, a further degree than um, we already currently experience and how those histories can be honored and lived as as a means of survival and, and preserving dignity. Yeah, I think it's like important to consider the, the potentials that developing these types of counter infrastructure and and the the social world that they create and are a part of can aid and abet um, some future fugitivity and, and other types of movement that might become necessary as the state infrastructure continues to like literally collapse, especially in the form of like levees and floodgates and these types of things. So I think with respect to food autonomy and its relationship with those counter infrastructural projects it's just completely necessary it's it's absolutely critical to the the functioning of those projects to the point which it's no longer an activisty activity it's the lifeblood and provides many avenues for imagination and experimentation inside those projects yeah i feel like in some ways, it relates to your question about mutual or like, you know, quote unquote, mutual aid or like what is often charity um, in certain capacities. But like, I guess if you if for someone who's a white settler to like know the answer to that question, I feel like is problematic. I think that for myself and like in these projects, like there needs to be like an acknowledgement of not knowing and like to not decide oh yeah like this is like the way it needs to be or like we're um, in this position where we're isolated and we're going out into these areas and we know what's best and we're gonna this is how we're gonna plug in but like being in community I think is one of the best ways to to dissolve that um or to challenge that and to challenge like oneself because you're opening yourself up to asking people like what is it what is it the community needs what is it that like how are, are the ways that we're able to plug in based on like for example like asking Miss Althea what she needs or um, what she wants rather than like deciding for her um, and I think that that extends itself to like indigenous communities where it's like okay well I don't know 
like I, I there's no way that I could know if if I'm not in community with indigenous comrades and so like I think the first step is to be connected and also to be receptive to criticism and to 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 be receptive to change and yeah just just being open to that I think is like the biggest part of that yeah I and I kind of add a little bit that like I think being kind of like guided by like a humbleness and and like a, a willingness to learn I think is is critical because a lot of the stuff that we're doing like say here in southwest Mississippi we're largely producing mushrooms raising tree crops and have like a plant nursery and these aren't like novel ideas by any means and we're actually really just doing like the means of both subsistence and survival for like countless people for basically since humanity has been around um and in in like all sorts of different forms and so to to pretend like we have some kind of like excellent idea that you kind of see in in some more like permaculture circles for example that we need to like proselytize or something or like bring to the like poor people who can't figure it out that it, that's just like totally backwards way of thinking and i think that just just kind of like being innocuous in a way or like just doing your thing quietly and then when it's time to show up and support if you're a settler to support indigenous comrades or black comrades or worker comrades or you know just your neighbors or your friends or whatever then show up with the capacities that you've built um, because there's nothing that you can do that will make you not a settler but your relationship with the land can change based on how you choose to live in relation to it. Yeah. And, and also just while we're on this, this topic, I, I wanted to clarify that our collective at Indian Bayou includes several indigenous people. It was like a combination of black and indigenous and white folks here. Cool. Yeah. Those are all really good answers. I appreciate you responding. So living in Asheville, as I do over the years, I've seen a lot of like little p- shops pop up that are like homestead themed they sort of like play with this settler concept of like going back to the land and and i'm basically wondering like if you have any ideas about how projects like yours can contribute to a countering to things like cottage core or other sort of niche capitalist re uh revisioning of what it means to live in relation to the land we are definitely very anti cottage core. Yeah, um, and, like the, and there's a lot there. I'm not sure quite where to start, but you, you yeah, get them. yeah. No, I mean, we were just laughing about it a second ago because I, I feel like we're like we go back into the city and we're like constantly labeled cottage core, like bringing <laughs> baskets of mushrooms into the city, and people are like, "Yeah, that's what you are." Yeah, I guess we can address the question with uh, it, with respect to like some kind of back to the land thing, huh? Uh, yeah. Try to focus on that. Um, I actually also don't exactly know what cottage core is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. I was hoping that someone else could describe it. Do you think that your project or that it's an interesting thing for your project to sort of engage with the idea of going back to the land in the sort of American imaginary of homesteading and independence and individuality that gets reproduced in things that I I have experienced as being cottage core. Like if I look at the hashtag or whatever on the twitter.com, like mostly there's a lot of images there. There's a lot of focus on aesthetics and again, aesthetics are not bad, but when people prioritize aesthetics over actual engagement and relationship between themselves and the land or their health or um, their autonomy or their neighbors, like that that falls into a trap that capitalism provides I'm kind of wondering like how you think food autonomy projects can sharpen their teeth because i think that food autonomy is a really important challenge to capitalism as well as to the individualized alienation of capitalist existence so that's that's kind of the question there well, I do think that the aesthetic of cottage core is definitely something that that needs to be attacked. And I think that 
I, I have been thinking about it a lot recently. I've, I've been thinking a lot about the ways that it just kind of this like really polished, like everything must look beautiful. Like everything is like presented for Instagram and everything. Like it, it does tie into this kind of like weird obsession with like purity and, you know, cleanliness and this kind of like, you know, traditional whatever the whatever the fuck that like I feel like has has kind of always been this like undercurrent in a lot of like hippie kind of counterculture in general like there's there's it's kind of always been there but since the pandemic I feel like it's kind of like fascist uh or potentially like fascist qualities of that like obsession with purity or whatever is like really becoming clear you know, or, or clarified to me in a way of like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to veer too much into talking about the pandemic instead of talking about, about food, but, you know, like I'm hearing the same sorts of people talk about how they're not going to get the vaccine. Not that I would tell anybody to trust the, the vaccine or the pharmaceutical companies in particular or anything, but saying they're not going to get the vaccine because it's going to make them sterile and it's going to like make their body like impure and stuff. Like you hear that from a lot of the same hippie types who would also say things like, Oh, we, we can't, we can't grow a garden in the city. The city is dirty. The city is contaminated. There's lead and all these toxins everywhere. And like, it's true. There's a lot of toxins in the city. There's also a lot of toxins in rural areas. And people end up turning it into this kind of like moralizing thing, which is also obviously coming from a completely inaccurate place, whether you're talking about the vaccine or the soil or anything like everything is contaminated. Like we, we are we are contaminated. Contamination is like a part of our lives or whatever. Like we're, we're full of bacteria that are not ourselves or they are ourselves, you know. So obviously, like the, the purity thing is a fantasy, but it, it is like just kind of scary, honestly, the way it's like coming up to the surface, you know, in some ways now. And I guess I don't have a clear answer of like how to address it, you know, but I I do think that in some ways the almanac is intended as like something that somebody who's in that mindset can pick up and not be immediately turned off to, but that can actually like really start to complicate some of those views and challenge some of those views. Yeah, I, I think being on the mushroom farm, I think we probably have lots of thoughts about uh, contamination and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of the like gourmet medicinal mushrooms that you would buy at like a grocery store, or farmer's market or something are like produced in these like super sterile environments, like indoors. Um, and definitely not going to knock them that with there's some people who are involved in Lavilla who grow like that. But there's this like constant like policing of the space and like disciplining of the space that is absolutely related to aesthetic, you know, like that, like, um, like any disturbance, um, is like really noticed or something. Um, there's like kind of like a conflict anytime there's like anything entering that space. And I mean, our our attitude here is like quite a bit different because we produce mushrooms outdoors on logs. And so there's just like, there's molds everywhere. There's, you know, it, it, it's literally sometimes there's like molds on our mushroom logs that we want in the soil, like in the trees we're growing. So like, it's, it's like always contradictory. And the way out of that is like through it, you, you need to promote diversity from the perspective of someone who like, like a fungal partisan is, is to like, in some ways increase contamination just like different kinds of contamination and creating more fungal com- competition and more fungal communion basically and again not not to um come at these um indoor mushroom facilities we you know hope to one day also be able to have those kinds of facilities um, because they definitely have their place but there's a definite distinction between like the laboratory and the home space and the the laboratory and like the school and a- any other um, public public space, and that a lot of that policing has has been a gendered uh, labor, and I think that that kind of uh, comes through with a lot of stuff that Hadley was talking about with like, respect to that being like very appealing towards a politics of purity or, or 
white supremacy, fascism, uh, heteromisogyny, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, I guess to go back to some of what you're saying about like the commodification of like the image of nature and that as it relates to like back to the land mentality or like cottagecore or whatever homesteading aesthetic and like I guess something I'm noticing in this conversation is just the constant thread of like connection and like trying to break down the the severing that happens when a commodity is created or is like maintained in like the public eye through like social media or whatever as a representation of what it's supposed to be based on what is the most marketable. I mean, it's difficult, right? Because like, you know, if you're trying to run a mushroom farm as a way to sustain yourself like there isn't a certain element of having to play into that where you still have to sell the mushrooms at the end of the day or whatever so i think that we all have to still participate in these systems that exist i mean i'm i'm new to um, lobelia as a project but i feel like part of what i'm seeing in lobelia and part of what i like want to continue to see is a like continued connection between the city and rural areas and I think that that's like what Lobelia seeks to do in a lot of ways I guess maybe that's like the one of the main pitfalls of the idea of like back to the land is that it feels like very isolating and it also feels like I guess like kind of in line with like prepping or like individualistic or like kind of like the new version of like having a nuclear family and moving to the suburbs or something where like it's like it's severed. And so like, I guess trying to like reverse that severing to like continue those connections. Yeah. I I think just the uh, piggyback on that idea is, is that a distinction between like food autonomy and isolated food production. And I think food autonomy is like inherently a very social thing and something that's directed towards a sort of communing or, or commenting or share just sharing um that a lot of the back to the land kind of thing or this like kind of macho like um i'm going to move to this cabin and produce all you know everything that i need to to sustain myself i'll produce it all or whatever which is just like totally ahistorical sounds extremely lonely um <laughs> and it's like not at all what should be considered like food autonomy. It's a, that's, um, that's a, you know, a solo project. Yeah. And I think it would probably have less inherent like adherence, um, or followers online if it looked a little less like Tom of Finland, a little more like Ted Kaczynski, because that's probably what you'd look like if you were sitting in a cabin by yourself for 20 years. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So when we're talking about the pitfalls of, like the homesteader mentality or the back to the land movement. I think what M said about self-sufficiency being this ahistorical myth that never existed on the household or family level in any agrarian land-based society, I think that's a good place to start. And obviously also there's a lot of things that need to be addressed with kind of the settler nostalgia or the nostalgia for American settler culture that seems to be a part of the the homesteading that some people and those things are very present and are a huge problem that needs to be addressed in kind of the larger movement or the larger wave of new interest in growing food and getting more connected to the land Uh, but at the same time I don't think that they're really you know, new or surprising concerns for anarchists or people who listen to this show. Like, we aren't trying to have just a bunch of self-sufficient nuclear families, and uh, we don't have any reverence for settler culture. In fact, for those of us who are white, like, if we find any inspiration or affinity with white people in early colonial history, it is only those people who were fully defecting from settler society and were welcomed into native society or who were otherwise like complicit in the struggle of native people against colonization and were assisting that in really material ways. 
And similarly, I, I don't think that we really suffer from the same strategic delusions or missteps of the, the back to the land movement in the 60s and 70s, uh, in which case a lot of people were trying to just drop out and their projects became isolated and weird in different ways. And I think that uh, there is a general understanding now, um, certainly among anarchists, that like our projects need to be conflictual. They need to be part of these larger struggles. We can't escape climate change. It's coming for us wherever we are. So there's like a lot of really material things I think people should be thinking about um, to to try to avoid um, that isolation because uh, it, it can happen even with the best of intentions if, you know, you get just too involved in in projects that are like, you know, keep you facing inward and you're just kind of like biting off more than you can chew with the land itself or what you're trying to do with it. Uh, you know, distance and gas prices and the, you know, jobs being nearby or not. Like all of these things are factors that matter when we're trying to figure out um, and cultivate the flows in and out of these spaces, the, the flows of people and resources that are needed to, to sustain a project and the people involved, like emotionally, physically, uh, financially, socially, etc. And that's going to look really different in every context. Um, but kind of just a general framework or an idea that I've found useful is this concept of the captured garden. So like the standard example of a captured garden is from... Uh, the, the height of the coal era in Appalachia when people are living in, in company towns, uh, where the, you know, the, the coal company controls everything. And in a lot of cases, people were actually required to have a garden. And so the mine owners, uh, didn't have to pay people as much because they knew they were growing their own food. And so this stands kind of in sharp contrast to just a generation or two before that when Growing food was something that gave people more freedom and autonomy and bargaining power when it came to dealing with the coal companies. Like if the if the wages were too low, you could just go back to the holler and grow food on your little plot of land and also have this this large ecological base, as it's called, to draw from around, you know, this this forest and hills that everyone was kind of using as a commons to graze their animals and hunt and things like that. And by the time of the company towns and the captured garden, a lot of that had been destroyed and taken from people. And so, you know, the captured garden is this example in which, you know, uh, growing our own food has become this thing that is no longer contributing to our autonomy, but is contributing to our subjugation. And so... I find that to be a really useful framework if we kind of try to transpose it a little bit onto the modern era and just kind of ask ourselves, like, is my community garden uh, contributing to, like, autonomy and giving people more ability to, to live their lives and, and, and have successful struggles, like, against their bosses and the state and whatnot? Or is it a captured garden? Is it something that's and like with a rural land project, you know, like if if an uprising comes along and you're too tied down taking care of the chickens every day in, to be able to go into the city, maybe in some ways that's functioning as a captured garden for you. Obviously, there's lots of other ways that, you know, a, a well-positioned project could have really useful uh, interactions with those conflicts. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Those are really insightful answers to a totally convoluted question, but you got what I was trying to communicate. How can people get a hold of the Earthbound Farmers Almanac? How can they learn out, learn more about Lobelia Commons and maybe get involved or contribute to either of the projects? The 2022 Almanac is uh, finally out. Uh, it was for like three months, basically, because of uh, a paper shortage. Uh, and if people can get it if they're trying to buy like an individual copy or just like a couple of copies 
they can support the project. All the money goes back into the printing of the of the uh, almanac, which we're still very far in the red. We all just get kind of paid out of pocket and uh, we owe a bunch of people a bunch of money. Um, so they can buy that at emergentgoods.com. They can also find us at, um, at Lobelia Commons on both Twitter and Instagram. There we have like more information about like stuff we're up to or whatever. Um, we're also posting the almanac, pretty much the entire thing. Um, in like social media posts over the course of the year. And if anyone is interested in like distributing it or like starting a book club or maybe selling it at wholesale or um, I don't know, like sticking it in free little libraries, I mean, pretty much you name it, like coming up with some way to use it or use it as a fundraiser, um, they can contact us on social media or lobeliacommons at protonmail.com. Um, and we're definitely looking for folks to contribute to next year's issue. We're going to uh, have the deadline for that is July 31st of this year. And yeah, to, I mean, feel free to reach out, send us pitches. Um, that you don't need to like come up with a whole um, piece. Just You can just set, like send us an idea or something. And yeah, really, honestly, the sooner is better. You know, we just put like in the subject, put 2023 Almanac in the subject yeah thanks again for having this chat and um yeah i look forward to look forward to putting in an order myself for a physical copy of it i'm sure i'll i'm sure that firestorm will carry it so I'll just grab one from over there yeah we actually have to send some uh to y'all uh, i don't i don't know if we did last year to firestorm yeah oh wait you probably dropped it off um no i just i gave it um to or i put it in the um uh tpp stack so it went out to folks at tpp but not firestorm i bet people really appreciated receiving some of that stuff on the inside that's that's awesome oh it was so cute because after like immediately after i had dropped them off someone texted me and was like i was just reading a letter that had a request for an, an almanac oh, that's cool. and Sweet. so like, it was like perfect timing super cute yeah the, um I have a number of like pen pals in Angola in Louisiana and um, we sent them to a few buddies in there and there's like this crew of guys who meet every now and then and they talk about like gardening and stuff and they, apparently they were super hype on it. Um, and that was like, that just like made my year last year. That's the best. Yeah. Yeah. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Based on data from fatalencounters.org. As a continuation of the tradition by Sean Swain of reading the names of people killed by the police in the so-called USA, I'll be reading for the month of July 2021. July 1st, A Tone, Lisa Ann Short, Richard Gaines, Sai Polar, Sorno Bit, Jesus Rodriguez, Brandon Tiny Lee Bright, Shannon Earl Smith. July 2nd. Douglas Ansari Osiemo. July 3rd. Robert Bob D. McDermott. Ricardo E. Carabayosa. Thomas Charlie Billings. Ashley Slama. July 4th. John Ruben Turbe Jr. Craig Locklear. Ricardo Torres Jr. Joshua Shane Hardigan. Julia Dale III. Matthew J. Morse. July 5th, Eduardo Mendez Amesquita, name withheld by police, West Valley City, Utah. Michael Lee Ellie. July 6th, Stephen Adam Calderon, Shelby Ray Hardin, Lineal Lamont Frazier, Jose Benitez Vasquez, Joseph Joe DeWayne McGrath, Samantha Lee Russell, Trayvon Lamel. Mitchell, July 7th, Christopher Lawrence C.A., Edward Daniel Santana, Jerry Allen Gunter, Robert Wayne Crocker, Vernell F. Muhammad, Victor Alex Alexander Demarest, July 8th, Borkat Ula, Doris D.J. Acri, Shannon M. Wilcox, Stanley Howard, Arcadio Castillo III, Clevante White, 
Markel J. Nevels, Michael J. Pettit, name withheld by the police, Waco, Kansas, Malon Taylor, July 10th, Avery Brendel Cogswell, Billy Newbold, Randy Jenkins Jr., July 11th, Jonathan Balchunas, Sean Marvin Thomas, Rashad Strader, July 12th, Bobby Hollingshead, Johnny Ray Kirk, Lewis Moores II, name withheld by police, Ontario, California, Charles McClaw, July 13th, Sierra Macy Pearl Martins, Jesse Joe Carranza, John R. McCarthy, Justin Patrick Powell, name withheld by police, Bayon, New Jersey. July 14th, David Salinas, Herschel Weinberger, Marquez Floyd, name withheld by police, Visalia, California. July 15th, David Lee Jones, Jennifer Ann O'Connell, Joshua I. Smith, Christopher M. Burden, Lori Beth Sihusen, Matthew James Sova, Tyrone J. Lewis, Javier Vern Hutt, Donald C. Williamson, Katie S. Foshi, July 16th, Don Marie Simpson, Ramiro A. Rosette Jr., Ryan Nicholas LaRue, Craig Heinzen, Gerardo Martinez Chavez, Tanisha Chapel, July 17th, Jeffrey Scott, Cantrell Deshaun Head, Maurice Sentol Mincy, Monica Arias, name withheld by the police, Appalachia, Virginia, Quentin Cantrell Bogard, Zachary C. Smith, July 18th, Clint Alexander Dearman, Irvin Peterson, Jasani John Baptiste, Leslie Stephen Scarlett, Tremar Rowe, July 19th, Jason Lee Freilich, Michael David Clifton, July 20th, Gilberto Martinez Nava, Miguel F. Hernandez Rodriguez, Mitchell Schuller, name withheld by the police, Mason, Ohio, Nevada Japoy Lee Eschult, July 21st, Gabriel Christian Syme, Zenon Lopez Guzman, July 22nd, Carlos Rodriguez, Colin Neal Condon, Derek Roosevelt Charlie Lee, Sean Daniel Tillerson, July 23rd, Jesus Salvador Valletta, Kevin Matthew Goodwin, Marcus Money Mitch Pettis, James Manzo, July 24th, Cody Brannon, David Wade Gaither, Farhan Zahid, Forrest Tyler Moore, James Patrick Farrell Jr., Justin Mendez, Michael O'Brien Farrell, Ryan James Keese, Thomas Edwin Royce, Yvette C. Smith, Daniel Milton, July 25th, Casey J. Stockton, Gabriel Sam Parker, Henry Brown, Jose Manuel Ramirez Jr., name withheld by the police, Crowley, Louisiana, July 26th, Christy Lewing, Herman Aguildo Gonzalez Jr., Jacob Bender, Caleb M. Brown, name withheld by the police, Indianapolis, Indiana, Damian Montreal Cameron, Nita Guadalupe Tijerina, Samuel Soto, July 27th, Alexis Wilson, name withheld by the police, Vacaville, California, 
Douglas Joseph Claiborne, Justin Damon Roberts, Kevlin Wallace, Lisa Height, Lissardo Lucas, Martha Jean Taylor, Robbie Taylor, Robert P. Uller, Michael D. Whitmer, July 28th, Becky Dietzel, Jonathan Andrew Pierce, Marlon Williams, name withheld by the police, Lake City, Florida, July 29th, George Trotras, James Haynes, July 30th, Luis Fernando Flores, name withheld by police, Cleveland, Ohio, Alexia Simpson, Elizabeth Anderson, George John Neenhaus Jr., Jayoni Leonard, July 31st, Brandon Michael Ryan Clorick, Keith Wayne Holmrighausen, name withheld by police, Yuli, Florida, name withheld by police, Sells, Arizona, Chad R. Rammel, Ruben Isaac Sanchez. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. Psst. You can cash app dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send dough to us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at at Swainiac 1969 or Twitter at at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.